Um, I'm Stefan Sigo. I'm with PNS. Uh, I am with the custom research side of the of the company. So we look after I look after the customer experience practice um, in North America, and I work with Mike, who runs the employee insight side of the company. And obviously, we work together to connect employee engagement with customer experience. Uh, just a quick introduction. I've been in the customer satisfaction that's become customer loyalty over the years, that's become now customer experience for yeah. 25 plus years. Um, it's my passion helping companies improve the customer experience, but also through research, helping improve the respondent experience in research. Um, and the, the recent advances in um, you know, moving from customer loyalty to customer experience, a much more holistic approach that takes into account employee engagement is really a big step up um, in that whole space. So I'd like to briefly uh, introduce the concept to you, uh, and then the main part of, of the presentation is going to be what Mike's going to present on the great results of a benchmarking study that we've launched just two months ago on uh, employee engagement and high performance organization. So I'll just um, get started, and the first thing Oh, by the way, this is like coming home for me. My first real job after grad school was as uh, in a talent acquisition team with a multinational corporation. So it's really cool to be back in the HR world um, and to bridge the HR and the you know, marketing research side together. Um, so what are we talking about today? We're talking about brand ambassadorship. And... Um, I'll be, like I said, you know, talking about mostly the customer side of it. The first thing I want to talk to you guys is you're probably asking yourself, why is this guy in front of us? We're HR people. We, I mean, not that we don't care about the customer, but we look after our employees. So what you're doing here, and I'd like to, you know, share with you my opinion as to why it matters. Um, so let me ask you a question. What, what makes the world go high level? Try, you know, Pat, give me your quick, quick answer. <laughs> Pretzels, yeah, food. Food is definitely part of it. I wish we, you know, I wish I could say love, right, because that would be the big one. But in the corporate world, it's not love, it's money. So um, this is, you know, money is why it matters. Because what um, we're, we've demonstrated and what we're working on is the relationship between employees and financial performance. And we are establishing that link through the customer. The way it works is that a dollar invested in employee engagement returns X percent increase in customer satisfaction. Think about um, uh, the hospitality industry, for example. If you've identified that um, having great um, room service, you know, speedy room service is a key factor of driving customer satisfaction, um, driving return to the same property um, after you've had a stay at that property. If you've identified that you need to get better, more engaged room service employees to drive that, you're going to make that link happen. If you make that link happen, you're going to increase your customer loyalty. And you know that in the hospitality industry, if you increase customer loyalty, guest loyalty, you're going to get your rest bar way up, right? Um, and that's what drives your growth. Whether it's market share, whether you measure it you know, from market share, from revenue, from profit, any way you look at it, this is really the chain. And this is what, um, and in fact, there have been a number of studies that have shown that, and one of the most famous ones was um, done um, for Sears years and years ago, was published in the Harvard Business Review, showed that a 5% increase with employees, that's in employee engagement, uh, returned a 0.5% increase in revenue, which, you know, if you're a multinational company, 0.5% of your revenue is a gazillion dollars, right? So this is why it should matter, and it should matter to you as well as it matters to marketing people and operations people. Um, the other reason it, it matters to you is because you're in HR, um, I'm in market research, we're all functional people. Functional people have to, um, uh, what's 
the war. They have to fight for budget dollars, basically. You have to go to the CFO, you have to go to the CEO, and you have to beg for dollars that are very scarce and that typically are destined for sales or production. So we have, you know, we have a small amount of funding, and if we can talk to our executives with that kind of story, that usually makes getting the funding easier. So um, now that I've got your attention and that it matters to you, just want to tell you a little bit about research. I'll spend literally five minutes on it to, to set the stage uh, for Mike to talk about um, the high performance organization model, maybe. All right. I, I mean, I could, you know, <laughs> go at signing, but thanks. So customer experience. Um, the first thing is when we look at the customer experience concept, we don't look at it in um, isolation. We believe that it starts with the brand promise. It is also constrained by market dynamics. It's constrained by regulations. It's constrained by the competition, by all kinds of external factors. And it happens within you know, your brand, what your organization has decided your brand is going to be, and those outside factors. Having said that, what do we look at in terms of research? We look at typically three components, customer loyalty, and transactional satisfaction, and employee engagement. So I'll spend a little bit of time on the, the customer side, and obviously Mike will spend a lot more time on the employee side. We look at that, by the way, within the yin-yang of rational and emotional dimensions, right? So when we talk these days about customer satisfaction, it's not all about the product like it used to be. Um, it's not only about the service or the price, as it's, you know, that was the evolution from satisfaction to loyalty. We now um, take into account the emotional factors that are at play when people talk about their brands and think about repeating purchases from, from brands. And at the end of the day, if we do it right, if we have the right connections among the components of the system, and then between each component and the company's KPIs, whatever they are, um, so operational performance for transactional stat, financial performance for loyalty, and organizational performance for employee engagement, that brings you to that equation I showed you before, that you know, if you get $1 uh, invested in employee engagement, that drives higher operational performance, which drives higher customer loyalty, which drives revenues. So that's, that's really the framework um, with components that need to be connected among themselves and connected to KPIs. That's, that's really where it's at these days. Number of companies have you know, are doing that both on the B2B side. EMC is, you know, is a big data storage company. Um, Starwood is another you know, leader in the hospitality industry. These are companies that uh, drive customer experience from the brand through the employee to the customer with connections to their KPIs and that's, that's really what seems that. What's customer loyalty, the relationship level? Um, all about, it's about driving strategy. It's about finding what's important to customers, which by the way, we all forget to do a lot of times. We just ask, you know, are you happy with us? Forget to ask them, what's important to you? And are we delivering what's important to you? Right, so it starts with that. It measures performance across those areas of, the, of what's important in their relationship. Uh, it looks at the competition, it enables you to model loyalty to financial outcomes. In other words, you know, why should we, doing, should we be doing this? Well, because we know that if we identify the right places to invest, to improve, we'll drive performance. Um, and the, the main outlet, if you will, in terms of you know, where does this go, where, where does the outcome of this go, it's for strategic initiatives, it's for high-level company, company direction. And we, you know, we all use all kinds of um, data visualization techniques to identify drivers of loyalty uh, based on their importance, on their impact, on retention, and, and things like that. So I'm not going to go through these charts, uh, but there are lots of ways to um, fine tune, if you will, what you're going to do with the results of studies like that. Transactional satisfaction, transactional feedback, 
That has to do much more with operational improvement. That's the, the you know, surveys you get um, when you go, for example, to a quick service restaurant. Often you'll get a um, URL uh, printed on your receipt that will drive you to a site to take a survey. It'll be a very quick survey that'll ask, you know, how was the food, how was the service, was the place clean, you know, will you come back, will you, will you recommend it to a friend, stuff like that. So that's transactional SaaS. It is as important even these days becoming more important than the strategic ones. Companies that are you know, strapped for funding are, tend to move their budget from the relationship level to the transactional level because with this, you can drive really operational improvement. You can find at retail store level, at restaurant level, at bank, at bank branch level, what to do to improve the service to your customers, to make sure that they don't switch to competitors, to make sure that they bring their friends. Um, and that's, you know, that's also a system to monitor adherence to quality standards, and so on and so forth. And that you know, drives actionable information to operations and line management. So these are the two big components that are on the customer side. Um, this one leverages technology in particular uh, much more so than the, the first one. You typically have a number of features on um, online platforms. Um, Sharon outlined a few just before. Action planning is, is one of them. Um, but we do a lot of work on social media monitoring and um, text mining and analytics to make sure that it's not all about surveys, which are you know push from the organization to the customers. It's also on the pull side. When people tweet uh, when people post you know, on Facebook that they had a bad interaction at a store they just visited, we're capturing that now, and we're blending it with what we're getting through surveys. So we have the ability to deliver um, measurements, if you will, that are very stable, but at the same time that are uh, brought to life by the commentaries that we get free form from customers. Uh, Mobile here is used, Sharon was um, telling you guys about how mobile is used, is leveraged to collect data. Here we are actually pushing data to, for example, in a, in a uh, quick service restaurant company, we would push push reports to district managers when they visit their stores so that when they walk into the store to do their visit, they have the information on that store where that store compares to the 10 best stores in the organization and, and so on and so forth. So again, a great deal of um, you know, leveraging technology to disseminate the information um, to the organization, which as we know, it's not all about a vision, it's also about how you communicate the vision and that's a great way to do it. Now to employee engagement, I'll just spend a minute on this. Um, you know, the focus here is on the culture. Uh, as Tim said this morning, you know, Employees don't join an organization, they join a culture. So we make sure that we have the right research tools to verify that this is, this is properly done. Um, but what we do here is we link um, the, and Mona from UBS was very interested in that this morning, asked a question about this, which is, you know, do you, do you connect your employee research study surveys with your customer satisfaction surveys and this is what, um, what we're doing, to make sure that, again, the, the brand infuses all the research in, you know, from the in to the out. Uh, we ask employees what's important to customers and vice versa, to make sure that we have the ability to, whatever action planning we do, whatever implementation we do, impacts both in a way that's, that's aligned. Um, and um, that's, that's about it. Um, and I'm going to pass the baton to Mike. So I'm the juggler here. I'm Mike Schrader. Um, Stefan wanted to talk about the customer side. I want to go a little bit further and talk about the brand side and the employee side. And there are a number of things that actually prompted us to do this and actually have this meeting. So I'm delighted that you're willing to take uh, a few minutes of your life here to spend it and share it with us so that we can share this information with you. A few years ago, we met with JWT and we were talking about some of their capabilities underneath this umbrella company that we work for, which is known as WPP. And we realized that there's some connections between what JWT is doing 
on communicating you know, what's important to employees either pre-hire or after hire. And we also realize there's also some additional connections with other work that we do within WPP. One particular group is called Millward Brown. Millward Brown is an organization, a specialist in the world of brands. And there's a new book that's out, and I brought a copy with me, and this is probably the easiest book title you'll ever see, um, but basically a book about growth. And grow, as an overall theme behind it, is a study of brands. And over the last 10 years, which brands have grown the most? And there's some interesting statistics in here that Jim talks about. And he studied a variety of different organizations from a marketing and a market research perspective, but recognized that the companies that grew the most outpaced the S&P by 400%. And it was all driven based upon the brand. So as we were talking earlier this morning, it starts with an idea. Oftentimes ideas then convert into the start of a company. And then those companies create cultures and other things. So in his study about brands, he's looking at what is it that brings it together. And we're going to take that information and bring it into the world of employee research and also weave it in with some recent study and information that we've collected in the last couple of months. So we put together a study in 2007 where we wanted to go out globally and find out what's on employees' minds in about 20 different countries. So in 2007, we tapped another organization underneath the WPP umbrella called Lightspeed Research that has millions of people around the world available to respond to different types of panels and questionnaires. In, 2000 study we cap in 2007, we captured some of that information and basically collected some baseline data or normative data. Now, in 2011, at the end of 2011, we repeated that study, captured some more information, and then wove in some information about the book Grow related to brand, and that's what I wanted to share with you today. So as we walk down through this, why did we do this study? One of the reasons is that we feel that there's a lot more to employee engagement than I want to continue to work here. And we certainly think there's more to it than I have a best friend at work. I think there's more there. And I think as organizations begin to mature and start thinking about employee engagement at different levels, you're going to be able to see this come alive within your organization. So our job is to go out and do some of this research, see what we can learn, and then bring that forward to you, share it with you in this early day stages so that you can see what we're seeing and maybe give us some additional ideas of what's happening within your organizations. Secondly, we definitely feel that there's a link between employee engagement and the company that they're working for, and that comes very clear in the book. What is it that is the ideal within the organization that you're looking for? Um, Patty had talked about United Technologies and one division within it is Pratt & Whitney. And if you've ever met a Pratt & Whitney rocket engineer standing on a tarmac watching the jets fly over, you'll see that there's a lot more to it than them just working for United Technologies. They're in it because they want to be in it. Same thing with a nurse, same thing with a school teacher. There's something that draws people to certain particular fields. And that also holds to is true with certain brands. The third question that we have, because it's hard to tease out of employee survey data, is are there top performers out there that are operating at maybe a different level, skill level within their organization, and do they then bring a different level of engagement to the organization and have kind of a different mindset. So we, we were curious and we wanted to get some information out. So we rolled out a study late in the year and it went to field uh, right around the end of the year and came out of field right around the 1st, around January 1st or 2nd. And basically we went out to 21 countries, about 17,000 people. And this is kind of a repeat of what we did in 2007, but we added some additional information to it. And it's across many different segments and performance levels. We even captured past 
employment experience. So it's an interesting study. I think it's got a lot of nuances in it that most studies don't contain. But as we were going through this, we also wanted to track some information that we collected in 07. We take that information and we blend it in with our current database because we survey a million plus employees every year within PNS. So we're able to continue to add to that current normative database around the world. But in the study, these are the various countries that we included that are in pink. So we did not pick up um, various countries in Africa or the Middle East, but you can see we've got a pretty good representation across other parts of the world. What we're finding in looking back at 2007 is overall employee engagement is up. It's up about four points from 2007. So before the recession and now some would argue still in it, maybe others would argue maybe a little bit post, overall we're starting to see a bit of an upward tick which is good for organizations. Where we're seeing a bit of a downward tick would be in those areas. Management support equality. That was much higher in 2007 than what you'd see today. And it can be broken down into a couple of key areas. Training to do a quality job. What's one of the first budgets to get snipped? Yeah, exactly. And so employees are responding that way as well. We're, they're also seeing is clarity of job responsibilities because what's another thing that tends to go down when you start to reduce staff? People and then you start to consolidate skill sets and requirements of the job. So those areas we're seeing a downward trend on where overall employee engagement we're seeing an upward trend. We have lots more to do to, to kind of uncover some more pieces of our study related to that but those are some of the early findings. From there, we wanted to look at the data set in a different way than you typically would. So we just didn't want to go in and look at, okay, what's employee engagement tell us? We wanted to actually create what you can kind of in your mind think of as three different demographic groups. One is, is there a difference between how high-performing organizations' employees respond compared to low-performing organizations? And then secondly, employees that are engaged or those that are disengaged, there a difference in how they respond. And then thirdly, is there a difference in how people that are performing at the higher end of their skill set different than those at the lower end of their skill set? So each of these we've set up as different demographics and we were able to categorize the data by how people responded to a very variety of questions that related to each. And so I would like to take you through that overall process and some of the things that we found. In the organizational performance side, this represents the whole population. So you've got 17,000 people that participated roughly. And you can see by the um, pie chart the different segments. So about 19% said that they were working in a company that's one of the best in their field. And you can kind of see the criteria in the past couple years, similar to other organizations in your field. So 19% of the population is basically saying, hey, I work for one of the leading companies in this field. So that's one of our criteria. Compared to 2% that's well below and 6% that's below. So the, some of the companies are lagging behind. Most of them are in the middle. A few of them are leading their industry groups. The second cut was looking at employee engagement. So across these 17,000 people, we were able to identify how many are highly engaged compared to those that are disengaged. And you can see out of that whole population how we've segmented that. So about 9% highly engaged, 31% engaged, 57% moderately engaged. And this is pretty consistent with what you'll find from other research that other organizations are doing as well. As far as the breakout of engagement, here we're looking at three different key areas. One is their overall perspective. You know, are they satisfied working for the company? Do they believe in the company's overall direction? The second area is pride. Are they proud to work for the organization? Would they recommend the organization? And then the third, which we think is critical when you measure engagement, is performance. 
And this particular area, what we find is people will often say, if you just kind of go out to a random group, hey, how's your level of performance? Most would say, mine's great. I'm not the problem, it's my coworkers. So there's an easy way around that and ask them, well, what do you think the level of performance is of your coworkers? And then you get a more accurate picture of actually how engaged that group of people um, is. So we're able to bring that into the, to the fold as well. So to be highly engaged, you have to be responding favorably to all of these questions. To be disengaged, it's unfavorable to these questions. And then personal performance. And this you typically can't ask in a company-run employee survey. Hey, how's your performance? You may get that behind the scenes through an HRIS system, but in this study, we're able to ask them straight out. And you can see half of the group said, I'm above average. So they're being maybe a little bit modest. 21% uh, said that they're experts, and some saying they're intermediate or even below average as far as their own personal performance. So as we're going through the data, we're able to then tie it in with some of the things that Stefan was talking about. We're realizing there's a bit of a model that's coming through here as far as what's happening on the employee side compared to what's happening on the customer transactional side and on the brand side. And what we're finding is the five wheels on the left are actually what's turning the organization's wheel. And that spinning then creates transactional uh, relationships with customers and customer relationships. And as that turns appropriately, then that can grow the brand. And then the brand can obviously create more customer loyalty and then financial performance follows as well. So as we dip into the first area, leadership, what we're finding is that there's a pretty dramatic difference across these three different demographic groups about what people think of leadership and how they value it within the organization. So as you look at these three different charts, you see in high-performing organizations, those that are leading their competition, leadership, 69%, that's the percent of people responding favorably to three or four leadership questions. Some of those questions are about immediate management. Some of them are about more senior management within the company. In lower performing organizations, they're not nearly as favorable. So they certainly don't see leadership as a group that's going to lead them to a higher level. The next area was around um, engagement. Those that are highly engaged the employees that said, I'm highly engaged, rated their leadership at 96%. Those that are highly disengaged gave their leaders a 3% favorable rating. I mean, the gaps here are unbelievable. So you can see that with those huge gaps, those that are disengaged, they, they don't even want to think about following the people within their organization that are currently leading them. And then the third area in the blue there is their own personal performance. Remember, they rated their personal performance. So those that said that they're high, a high-performing employee, they came down a bit on the leadership scale. But those that are lower performing are even lower when it comes to traits of leadership within their organization. So that's one quick view around that. Do you see that within your organizations as far as the high performing? I see a few heads nodding. Same type of findings? And we're seeing the same thing. And leadership, obviously, is something that's often measured in employee surveys, especially immediate supervisor. So maybe some no earth-shattering results here, but really critical, especially when you look at the highly engaged and the disengaged side. Some leaders, and in the book, Grow, you'll hear the author talk about leaders as also being artists. And it's a rather interesting analogy when you think about it as far as moving away from just leadership to really creating something, a picture, uh, a vision for that organization. Often the way an artist can create something either on uh, you know, paper or other ways. 
So we listed out a few. We even threw in our WPP boss, Martin Sorrell, in case you haven't ever seen a photo of him. The second area that came through is goal strategies and brand. And this we thought was really intriguing because in many ways, this is the key difference on leaders. Can they reshape and refocus the organization just a few degrees, maybe compared to the competition, and set up what we t often call a new brand. Um, and then from that kind of shifting, you will then set up your series of goals as well as the strategies that you want to follow. And I've got a few examples here as well. But this, I think, is one of the keys to true engagement of employees. Is what is their overall view of the brand? And what do they think of the goals and the strategies of the company? As we look at the results, again, you see these significant differences across the groups. So as we're looking at the high-performing companies, the employees that are working there, dramatic different views as far as strategies, goals, and overall brand compared to low-performing companies. Employees that are highly engaged, look at the gap there. You know, they really recognize that this is one of the things that's motivating them within their organization to make a difference. You still see the gap on the high personal performance as well. They want to work. If they're a high personal performer, they want to work for that company that's got the leadership, that's got the goals and the strategies to be able to make it happen. Here's a couple of quick examples, and this is, goes back to the strategic thinking. Both of these happen to be hometown companies. We're from Chicago, so bringing in a little bit of Chicago light here. Groupon, anybody a Groupon user here? About half of the group. All right, the rest are coming your way. When Groupon started, there were probably two, three, four hundred marketing companies in Chicago maybe 1,000 in the U.S., maybe 10,000 in the world. Why did that company grow so quickly? Anybody? Pardon me? It's mobile. Others? Especially those group on users that are out there? Easy to use gets the information to you. It's interesting, when you go back to the concept that we're talking about, they took the idea of marketing, which has been around for years, but turned it a few degrees and started coming up with different ways to email people offers and different ways to be able to work with their customers. Still marketing, still coupons, still a discount, they just turned it slightly. But that slight turn, that organization has now grown from literally a few employees a few years ago to over 10,000. And obviously um, been through an IPO as well and going through that entire growth process. Another one that's a little bit less known is Red Frog Events. Anybody ever hear of Red Frog? No. It's an interesting organization. Anybody here ever run in a triathlon or a marathon or a 5K event? We've got a few. Oh, there we go. There. <laughs> or a one-block event. <laughs> Sharon's in on that one. So the, the founder of Red Frog, he went and he joined a couple of 5Ks on that side of it, you know, and you get done with the race and that's about it. You pack your things and you go home and he was thinking, there's got to be a better way to do this. So he started the organization, again, took the basic concept as a leader, turned it a few degrees, and now Red Frog is growing at two to 300 percent a year. They've had events that in the U.S. that they've had over 850,000 participants attend. They get 2,000 resumes a month from people that want to join the organization. They have unlimited vacation time as one of the perks for new employees coming on board. But what did, they, what did they do? They changed the strategy a little bit. Going into it, he said, hey, I can put on these types of events, but we're going to make them different. We're going to have a big party at the end. We're going to have wine tasting and beer and music. 
We're going to change the event so it's not just a 5K run, but we're going to have you dive through mud pits and climb over walls and do other things. Anybody here ever participated in that type of an event? Callie has, and your son has. All right, terrific. So same thing on leadership, and it's rather interesting how the, you set the strategy, the goal, the objectives, and you create that overall brand, and it can be just by moving it a few degrees, and it makes a world of difference within the employee base. Red Frog events, they have one they call the Warrior Run that you can sign up for, and it's like a 5K, but you've got to go through all of these obstacle courses along the way. And it varies depending upon where it's run. So they may one, run one out in California, and they've got you running through certain areas. They run another one down in Florida, and they'll have an alligator pit that you have to run past or something. So they come up with all kinds of creative and innovative ways to be able to make it more fun. That's on the strategic side. On the flip side, again, moving things a few degrees, these two organizations are rather interesting if you've watched their growth over the last 10 years. Who was Best Buy's number one competitor 10 years ago? Circuit City. Yeah, absolutely. Circuit City. And Circuit City was in a book called Built to Last. Didn't quite make it. <laughs> But the key difference here, on the inside of the organization, Best Buy was at a time where they were kind of neck and neck with Circuit City and actually losing on the brink of bankruptcy. And they decided they needed to make some changes within the organization. And one of the key changes is how they paid people on the floor, where they were a non-commissioned sales group. Circuit City was a commission sales group, so a different philosophy and a different strategy on the inside of the organization. On the flip side, Enterprise Rental Car. Anybody rent from Enterprise here? Lots of folks. Enterprise Rental Car has grown over the last, let's say, 15 years from about 15,000 employees to about 80,000 employees. They make more money than all the other rental car companies combined. A key component of that is how they structure their offices and their growth within the organization. Extremely entrepreneurial. Every employee is tied to the profits of the organization and gets paid on that every month. Think about that for your accounting team. Every month. So when it snows in Chicago and there's a few more fender benders and people are taking their cars in, the folks at Enterprise are actually kind of happy about it because they're going to see that in their paycheck soon. So the strategy, leadership, goals and objectives, it's really important on just a few degrees difference can make a world of difference within the organization. The third area is capabilities. So as we get into that, you can see the differences here in how people respond to capabilities within the organization. Capabilities can mean a variety of things. It can be the tools and equipment that you have. It can be the information that you have. It can be the training that you receive. Patty talked about their ACE program and the training at United Technologies. Those are capabilities within the organization. A few classic examples here of why do companies wish to go public? One of the key reasons is to increase their capabilities. They need the funds to be able to go out and buy more things. So a couple of companies that LinkedIn's already gone, Facebook's on the verge of going public, but they're looking for those resources so that they can increase the capability. Because it's one thing for the leadership of the organization to say, hey, can you do this? It's another thing for the employees to say, yeah, I could if I had these things, these tools, this information, these opportunities available to me. So we're saying that's a key component as you're thinking about employee engagement. It's hard to engage people that don't have the things they need to be able to deliver to the customer that experience that the customer is looking for. 
we go on from there, the fourth area is employee engagement. Certainly as the wheel turns, you need all of those. You need leadership, goals, capabilities, and then an engaged workforce to be able to pull that together. And here's what we're seeing on this side as far as engagement itself. And you can see the gaps. The higher performing companies have, high, have higher performing scores and more highly engaged people. The engagement side goes from 100 to 0 because that's our split, the demographic cut that way. And then the personal performance. This was interesting to me. Those that are higher performers, typically higher engagement scores, 70% compared to 20%. So it's a classic. If you have low performing employees within your organization, most likely those are also your most disengaged people and something that you've got to wrestle with as far as how do you deal with that within the organization. If we take a look at engagement by organizational performance, this is kind of intriguing. So on the left-hand side, you have your highly high-performing organizations, and you can kind of see the bars that show, well, how many of them are highly engaged? Not all of them. How many of them are engaged? How many are moderately engaged? How many are disengaged? That's the group on the left. So very few disengaged employees in what this group said was their level of performance. But see how that changes as you move to the center and then to the right? Where all of a sudden in the average organization you see a decline in the number of highly engaged or engaged employees. It's an interesting way to look at your data and it's something that you may want to think about doing within your own organization. You know, if you're running a hotel group or you're running retail stores or other types of segments, Take a look at the high performing compared to the low. Lay it out in this fashion. See if you see similar types of trends. Again, the challenge is what do you do with those moderately engaged and disengaged employees? They're actually holding the group back. And how do you deal with that as an you know, organization as a whole? If we go from there, the next piece that we found in kind of discovered along the way is this concept of brand ambassador. You know, if you have this highly engaged employee, are they more likely to be an ambassador of your brand? You'd like to think that they would, because that then ties back to what Stefan was saying about the customer experience. So are they going to respond more favorably about the organization? Are they going to deliver at a higher level you know, when they're in those situations with customers, whether internal customers or external. So as we move there, we took a look at the data as well and note the differences. Again, it's dramatic. The higher performing companies have more people that respond much more favorably to brand ambassador questions. And those questions are about individual people, work groups, support from the supervisor, receiving training, across the board more favorable. More highly engaged employees, much more favorable about being a brand ambassador to the organization. And then on the other side, the high performing employees are also responding that way. So consistency across that group. How many of you ever walked into a kind of a service organization, maybe fast food or hotel or retailer, and the employee was the furthest thing from a brand ambassador. <laughs> we've, all, we've all been through that, absolutely. Um, and there's all kinds of examples out there. I wanted to pull up a couple here. Um, one specific one about Southwest Airlines. Anybody here fly Southwest? Have you noticed the difference when you're on Southwest compared to other airlines? The selection, the way they bring people on board, the way they train them, it's a completely different culture, which creates then a completely different brand experience. So we've got a little video that we want to show to you, but to make this come alive, you've got to work with us through this. He's going to give you some instructions. Think of yourselves as being in the front row. All right, you ready? 
Get it. Good evening, folks. Welcome aboard Southwest Airlines Flight 372, service to Oklahoma City. Those of you that have flown us before know that we do things a little bit differently here on Southwest. Some of us tell jokes, some of us sing, some of us just stand there and look beautiful. I, unfortunately, can do none of those. So here's the one thing that I do know how to do. We're going to shake things up a little bit. I need a little audience participation. Otherwise, this is not going to go over well at all. Is this your cue? So here's what I need, especially you guys in the front, because you know what's coming. All right, I need a beat, all right? All I need you to do is stomp and clap, and I'm going to do the rest, because I just, I've had five flights today, and I just cannot do the regular boring announcement again. Otherwise, I'm going to put myself to sleep. So, you guys with me? All right. So give me a stomp, clap, stomp, right, let's go. clap. Come on, stomp, clap, stomp, clap. They don't beat there. There you go. Keep that going. This is flight 372 on SWA. The flight attendant's on board serving you today. Teresa in the middle, David in the back. My name is David, and I'm here to tell you that. Shortly after takeoff, first things first, there's soft drinks and coffee to quench your thirst. But if you want another kind of drink, then just holler. Alcoholic beverages will be $4. If a monster energy drink is your plan, that'll be $3. And you get the whole can. We won't take your cash. You got to pay with plastic. If you have a coupon, then that's fantastic. We know you're ready to get to new places. Open up the vents, put away your suitcases. Carry on items, go under the seat. In front of you, so none of you have things by your feet. If if you have a seat on the road with the exit, we're going to talk to you, so you might as well expect it. You got to help evacuate in case we need you. If you don't want to, then we're going to reseat you. Before we leave, our advice is put away your electronic devices. Fasten your seatbelt, then put your trays up. Press the button to make the seat back raise up. Sit back, relax, have a good time. It's almost time to go, so I'm done with the rhyme. Thank you for the fact that I wasn't ignored. This is Southwest Airlines. Welcome aboard. <laughs> United Airlines, I guarantee. <laughs> Ouch. But you can see, you know, an engaged employee, what a difference. He said that was the fifth time he was going to do that that day, let alone that week. And, you know, to keep the energy, to get the customers there, to get that reaction from the customers, because that's a point of transaction, which is critical. But he's not going to get there if he's not an engaged employee. It's really interesting talking with Southwest pilots, talking with Southwest um, customer service people. They are at a different level compared to their competition. Their financial performance is showing that. Their growth is showing that. Their customer SAT scores are showing that. It's across the board. So that way I thought was a great example. We wanted to bring that in because to us, that's where it needs to go. It needs to go beyond engagement to that level of brand ambassador to be able to really make it link together. The other piece that we wanted to look at was, is there a link over to the other side, on the customer side? So in the same study of 17,000 people, we were asking them, hey, what do the customers think about your products and services? And here are the findings that we're seeing. Again, dramatic differences. The companies that are doing better, much higher scores on what they think the customers think of their organization. Those that are more highly engaged, much higher. Those that are performing at a higher level, much higher, so dramatic difference there in link. We also asked the people, what companies do you work for? And so on the top, there were some of the companies that they work for, the high-performing organizations, and some of those I'm sure you'd recognize. Some of the lower-performing companies who are also struggling. So it's interesting to see that. And we've got lots more to do on that particular side to be able to learn more about this link between brand ambassador and customer experience. Customer experience, Lexus, rather interesting, part of Toyota. When you read information about Toyota, and it's, there's some quotes in the book about the Toyota uh, strategy and the, what Toyota's been through in the last couple of years with some of their recalls and things. But Lexus is another one. They actually talk about it's the Toyota way or it's the Lexus way. So they taken this concept of a brand all the way to the level of, of using those terms as people talk within the organization. Just as I'm sure you, UTC talks about ACE, it's the UTC way we're going to use this ACE process. 
So these organizations have done that as well to be able to extend that brand right into that level. So as we kind of wrap it all up, we're seeing those five wheels on the left-hand side important for turning that organization and creating that customer experience, which happens on the right. When that goes well, you're going to increase that overall brand promise to both groups, both the employees as well as the customers on the other side of the organization. The book Grow, it's a great book. It was amazing to me how much information in this book written by a chief marketing officer is directly focused on HR as well as the organization development work. And to me, this is probably working at the highest level of OD. If you can work at the brand level and impact the brand for the employee and for the customer, now you're operating at the le right level within organization development and HR. And here's some of the different quotes that are created. This is a quick snapshot of this group of 50 as far as tracking them over the last 10 years and how they've done as far as outperforming the competition, or I'm sorry, outperforming the S&P over that same time period. We should all talk to Jim, put our money into his 50 and our 401ks would have been far better off. Oh well, missed that one too. I think one of the keys that he talks about is in creating the brand, he breaks it down into some kind of overall kind of humanistic ideas. You know, what does the brand really stand for? So he talks about, you know, uh, Coca-Cola and the concept of joy there. You know, that's what they're trying to bring forward. Or Starbucks, you know, enabling those connections. It's more than just selling coffee. It's can we create an environment that people can connect. And while they're here, they'll drink our coffee and eat our food as well. So you can see how he breaks it out into those different buckets. I think an interesting challenge for us is, so what's your organization bringing forward? And do you have kind of this higher purpose that you're trying to achieve within the organization? And does that come through to your employees as well? Here's a classic example of that. Another online retailer, why does this one make it? Sharon's excited. Shoes. <laughs> but they jumped into a busy field. There are a lot of people selling shoes already. But they wanted to do it in a different way. Again, a few degrees different to be able to bring a different level of brand experience and then get their employee, employees on board to really be brand ambassadors to be able to make that happen. So it takes all of those pieces to be able to turn that wheel. Wanted to um, talk about, I guess, a couple of final pieces. One, we're just now starting to get our hands around all of this information. So there's more to come. We'll be sharing that with you in the coming months. Secondly, here's some questions that you may want to think about and be asking yourself and, and your organization when you start thinking about this whole area of what turns the wheel within your organization. Do your leaders focus on more than just an engagement score? Hopefully they see beyond that. It's not just about that score. Do they get it? Do your leaders understand the link between what it is that they're doing, strategy, being a few degrees different, and then moving that across as far as capabilities and engaging their people and getting them that to that level of being true brand ambassadors. Is that happening in the IT area, in the finance area, as well as on the customer service side? Do your employees know what your brand ideal is? Have you communicated that? And is it a working at a higher purpose? Truly successful brands go to that level. Any folks ever, do you know what the uh, IBM brand is now? Anybody hear that one? IBM, let's make this a smarter planet. It's been hugely successful for them to draw in employees as well as to take their customers to another level. That's the kind of the example there. Do they live that brand ideal? 
and do you live it inside and out? Because it's one thing to be able to say that to a group of customers, but it's another thing, will they deliver that? And Pat, you had a great story about that the other day about, you know, it's one thing to be able to say it here, but then... Absolutely. Yeah, world class my ass. And I'm sure we've all heard that within organizations. You know, you hear the marketing over here and HR is hearing this, you know, separated in two different silos. Do your employees know the brand promise? Do they know how to deliver on it? And do your leaders keep your top talent? Now, as obviously, as we're seeing, top talent's critical for organizations and are you hanging on to that top talent? And now as the economy starts to pick up, it may be even more difficult to hang on to them because more opportunities may open up for them. So that's what we wanted to share with you. Obviously, lots to come. We'll stay in touch with you and give you more information and more highlights about the information that we've collected. But hopefully we've uh, given you a few extra ideas here during our session. So thank you.